need another bruise. You think, oh, there's not, he's gone. You know? And then I start to see, yeah, there's, there's some anomalous people walking around, you know? Uh, God or the universe or whatever you want to call it doesn't do anything just once. I mean, it'll make one kernel bruise, but multiplicity, as I learned from Sun Ra, and from nature is the rule. So you guys, please meet J.R. Uh, we've actually we've got another chair for him. We've actually uh, played on a bunch of stuff together. I met JR through uh, Weedy Bremer. How many of you guys know who Weedy Bremer is? Yeah. Okay, for those of you that don't know, Weedy Bremer is, to, to me, the uh, old Atucci of our generation. He is 111 generations of drummers, direct descendant in Ghana. And he's here now, and I met him when he was playing with, I guess, End Power. I think I met him at New Orleans Jazz Fest the first time. And um, Adam Deitch was like, you and Weedy gotta be. He actually knew my African drum teacher from DC, Kojo Baby, who was also from Ghana. Um, so we connected really hard. And then um, somehow I met this gentleman, <laughs> JR. Um, do you want to tell them a little, just a little bit your short story, or just should we just tell them? Has anyone seen my boots? <laughs> <laughs> Nobody. <laughs> right when he said it, it's eleven eleven. <laughs> Do you know what? Oh. Yeah, this is like two roots rocks ago. I was down there balancing rocks with Nigel. Yep. <laughs> I was only here for like a couple hours. I figured that's probably the best thing to do here. And I'm still looking for my boots. Because <laughs> I lost them when I took them off down there. And I set them to the side. You guys have been down there. There's like a bunch of rocks. Yeah. And then, but there was this pile of rocks. Yeah, you. Yeah, and so if you look next to the big rock, like the medium big rock, then to the right, there's like a wide rock, and I set them right there. <laughs> now they're gone. We're gonna be looking for them. Is it? Yeah. Well, believe it or not, me and him have recorded together with, actually this was just on one recording. It was Vince Gill, uh, Paul Riddle, the original drummer for the Marshall Tucker Band, Marcus King, Charlie Starr, um, and we did that at Peter Frampton's studio in Nashville, which was a trip because we, you know, the um, the wall is covered with pictures, and Frampton on this particular huge wall, all of them. He doesn't look more than about sixteen in it, and there's just like young to everyone, Elton John, you know, Rod Stewart, every Beatle, you know, clap, just everybody. And I'm like. This wall he did by the time he was 20. <laughs> you know, we were like, Jesus. What a day, I mean, a couple of days that was. Yes, I mean, dream come true, you know? They had Snickers there. <laughs> they also had really good coffee, actually. It was <laughs> sweet. And then everyone in there who was doing notes was like, straight <laughs> metal down there. And like, y'all, I remember there was a time, was the producer, Chuck? Chuck Ainley, yeah. One of the, probably the top producer in Nashville. Yeah, he loves Levi jeans with the button that goes up instead of the zipper. He told me talking about that for like 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, we gotta get this guy an endorsement with Levi's. <laughs> yeah, he's super nice. You, you play, you play drums on that one. I, okay, here's the story. You went the crazy story? that. You, all right. This is where I start. So, 
I'm hanging out in Nashville two and a half years ago, two years, something, a couple something years ago, and we, like, I was just hanging out. I was, at the time, I was doing the podcast thing with... But you were living with Heather Gillis from Roots. Yes. Right? Yes. Y'all know Heather Gillis from Yeah. Roots. Which she's opening for Jack White right now. Let's just say that. Legend. So, you know, we're in Nashville, just like music in and coffee in and skateboarding sometimes. And she didn't skate, she can't kick flip. <laughs> <laughs> and anyway, I was hanging out a lot of time and then I would help this guy do this video program he had. And it's, they would call it a podcast, but it's like a video program. And he's a really funny dude. He's, uh, Theo, y'all know uh, Theo Vaughn? Oh, yeah. So was, they're helping him with his video program, filming and like doing the, piecing it together for him and putting it out on the internet. <laughs> Publish. <laughs> you guys know how it goes. And, and then I get a call from Theo. Hey, I'm doing a record in Nashville. I'm like, I'm in Nashville. He's like, I know, that's what I'm calling you. <laughs> and so I was like, all right, what's the address, you know? So I, I drive up, and I remember I just walked in the front door because yeah. I had the address, I guess. It looked like a house. Yeah, it does. So I, I was like, all right, until this where I hang it out. He told me to come, so I just walk in the door, walk past a couple of guys. And like then I get almost past them. They're like, "Hey, what? Are, who are you?" <laughs> <laughs> and that was Chuck and Bobby. Yeah. Chuck, the producer, and Bobby, the a agent, but also just Paul's really good friend. Yeah. Legendary natural. Yeah. He found the old crow medicine show guys, right? Busking on the street. Anyway, I walk past them. They're like, "Oh," and I'm like, "No, I'm here to see you too." They're like, "Okay." in there and so I went in there and you're tracking bass to something probably that one of those ones we already tracked bass to remember at, when we were doing the ozone yes. we tracked we were probably retracking yeah. and it's just crazy I mean I started you're supposed to film it right I brought my camera yeah 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 yeah, yeah. You're supposed to film it then you <laughs> yeah long story short I was filming it for a couple days and they keep saying, we need congas, we need congas, and I'm just, my job is to film, so I'm filming. And finally got to like the last day, and they're like, we need congas. <laughs> and I'm like, hey Paul, I can do that. I have cut four records this month. I promise I'll do a good job. <laughs> he goes, okay, bring me tomorrow. See you at 10 a.m. So, that morning I woke up, and you wouldn't believe it, but I brought my congas in to the studio, as requested, and did them all. Did all the songs in like a, what are those blocks, a three hour block or whatever. Yeah. We cut all the songs in one take, except there's one song with a five part in it, and I ain't heard any back catalog of anything March Tucker at that point. Was there's a song with like a five part? I don't know. Anyway, I didn't assume the five part. My bad. In four four major music, and so took that song again, did it, and then they're like, "Yeah, freaking sounds great, whatever." And I'm like, "Okay, cool, sweet." Didn't even have to do any notes, right? I just did the the, the rhythms that time. It was super simple. And yeah, and then that afternoon I went to Theo's, and then that was the day that Theo was doing a podcast with Shane Gillis, and I filmed that. And then, I, yeah, Shane is hilarious. And then I edited that up, and then I think that was the last day, because you, you had already flown back by the time that happened, because you were there for like three days, and, or something. Like that. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And then Marcus came in, cut his parts, that, and I cut my parts that day. And then, then that was it. Uh, then now on this one day, you you worked with Vince Gill and <laughs> Marcus King and Charlie Star and Paul Riddle all in one way. 
I didn't think of wanting Shane Gillis. <laughs> That was a resume day. I'll say that day I went home and I changed my entire resume. <laughs> everybody, everybody moved down about 10 slots. <laughs> but I, I knew him as a guitar player, you know? Yeah, no. And it was cool because he's like, I don't really, you know, I'm just learning on my own completely. Never had a teacher or anything. And so my little system, my, my ozone system with the dots was helping him learn harmony. So he would. He would text me and be like, man, I sat in with these guys and actually did pretty good. Those dots are working out. I was like, oh. sick dots. <laughs> Straight up, y'all. You met the colonel too, didn't you? You met with him. Yeah, yeah. I, so, yeah. I, I think I've known him for about 2,000 years at this point. <laughs> and, but I'll tell you this one time, I met him with Heather Gillis, but this is the thing, like, sometimes you meet him and you don't even talk to him, like, you just meet him. Yeah. And this was one of those times when we was in, I spent a lot of time in St. Pete, Florida, I got a band down there called Ant Hill Cinema, and we play this, yeah. Yeah. Sick. <laughs> I didn't know knew that band, hell yeah, They're just, they are awesome, crazy. And we was down there, and my Heather called me and said, hey, uh, there's this guy asked me to come uh, sit in at the Dunedin Brewery, which is the best brewery in Florida. They support live music. You know about them? Oh, I love those guys. He loved them. Oh, he, he fit in just fine. He did. And I go down there and I'm like, you know, sitting in a chair watching people play music like they do. And they're doing like lots of stuff. They're doing notes, they're doing rhythms, they're doing crazy notes, they're doing crazy rhythms. and But also, outer space soul. And that's what I picked up from that. I was like, wow, this is the most soulful outer space music I've ever heard in my life. It's saying a lot. I finally remembered that, you know, everybody here is, oh, this is the most soulful guy on the planet. But this guy was probably the most soulful guy in the universe. And anyway, he's up there doing a solo, do, 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 do. and then he passed off solo, do a solo, do a solo, and then came to this part where he decided he was going to do a solo. Except what he did was he took his guitar off and set it down. And well, I would show you, but can I borrow your single? I don't have any boots right now. So <laughs> he's just like he goes like this, and he's just staring at everybody. While like the music's building, you know, behind him, ambiance or whatever, notes and stuff. And it's like getting intense and he goes like this. And then he goes like this. You know, 
Semantics is what hangs everything up, okay? That's why intention is what's important, because the intention behind a word can be almost uh, 180 degrees, right? Um, when, he, when Bruce talked about ego, he meant it in a negative connotation. So, just, he said, you know, gotta get that ego out the way, or whatever. You know, usually it was negative. There is such thing as a healthy ego, and that's what we all strive for, actually. Um, a humble ego. Um, but Bruce was very aware of his choice of words. If you knew what he meant by it, you know, some of them seem nonsensical. But once he knew the language, it's like, you know, time for you to take a bass break. <laughs> you know? Once you know what it means, you know what it means, you know. But usually, like, I'm, I'm guessing you're talking about our uh, album, uh, or the song, uh, No Egos Underwater, you know. Um, well, you know, that's, uh, uh, I mean, what does the word ego, and the thing. different things ego implies? I'm trying to restate the question for people that can't hear you. Um, that's a lot to unpack. There's, you know, sometimes I think it just comes down to fear, because fear is the catalyst for, uh, myri for myriad negative ego things, <laughs> like uh, overthinking. You know, um, I can't do it as egotistical. How do you know? That's just a completely BS statement. If, if you haven't done it before, how do you know you can't do it? You know, um, so there's a lot of, I, I think uh, fear can also like be, uh, make you overplay, or you want to grab the spotlight, or you know, it can manifest in so many different ways, you know. I mean, I learned this in like addiction therapy. They said that everyone that is addicted to something has either been emotionally abused, physically abused, sexually abused, or abandoned, or had abandonment. And I had to figure out, I was like, wow, my childhood didn't include any of those things. I had to try to figure out where, which cat, you know, how did I fit into that. But the, the key is, those traumas will manifest, it can be gambling, food, sex, alcohol, drugs, work. Uh, I think a lot of the people that are the crazed 1% uh, vampire capitalists, they're just, it's an addiction. They're just addicted to making more money. Like it's never enough. It's never enough power, and never enough money. And they just are driven by whatever fear. So it can manifest in all the different ways. That's what Bibles are for. <laughs> because they tell you all the different ways. You know, there's a lot of different ways that happens and it covers all of them. That's what stories are for. You know, whether they're fairy tales or soap operas or Star Wars or Harry Potter or any Bible um, from any culture. Right? So, um, read the stories. Get the lesson. Do you want to say something? I was just going to say, along the lines of your question, uh, Bruce, uh, I'll send a picture of what Bruce told me that I wrote on a napkin. I have all of the, you know, tone, taste, timing, thread of vomit, face, and bud intention was really his way when I met him, is that he delineated how it, ego affects your performance. And face intention is when you're using your talent as an attention net. You're trying to get attention and bring it into yourself. It's like what Garcia said. He goes, well, the Grateful Dead were not going, look at me, look at me, look at what no, I can do. No. It's it not was gather me. around. Gather around. Yeah. We just happened to be the musicians. We're making a sound. It was a giant drum circle. And the reason they collected versions of tunes is because it would bring back the healing patterns that they had gotten from different shows. And that was the first time I saw a taper. I happened to get the right taper. He was great. And he explained everything to me back in 1989 
I saw the fishing poles go up and I'm like, what, you know? And like again, Southern Baptist, I didn't know anything. Um, and I, I just was brought to tears by him explaining the aspect of allowing taping, encouraging people. And it's not about, hey, tape our shows, you listen to us again. We'll get more hits on our Facebook. It wasn't any of that crap. It was really all about their intent for the music to go as far as it possibly could go, especially after they died. And you know, folks, that's how, if you really want to set up your ego, you have to do what Odile said earlier. You have to be aware that on every level, you are living one of the last times. <laughs> There's nothing you'll do today that's not one of the last times you'll do it. So do it as if it is one yes. of the last times. And that's how gratitude is born, and that's how gratitude stays in your brain like and stays functional. Yeah. You know? And I got one quote from Bruce, too, that about yeah. this that occurred to me when you said about face and butt intention. But face intention, he meant, um, he would always say this, O'Teal, respect is an evil that corrodes the mind. Respect. Now, I want respect, you know, but I saw this, you know, many of my heroes, one of them in particular whose name I won't say at the moment, um, they're jazz guys. They didn't get respect, you know, and they could outplay like everybody. <laughs> and I've seen, I've seen how it affected them. And after being with Colonel Bruce, I was like, why would I want the respect of the people who are incapable of it? It's, that's not going to be dri driving me. That's not going to drive any of my motivation to prove to you that I still am, yes, a man, even though I'm black. That I'm not three-fifths of a man. You know, I'm actually a superhuman. <laughs> you know? I'm a magical being, you know. But now that now that I know it, I don't need anybody's approval, you know. And that's why you see a lot of my heroes and a lot of Bruce's heroes had this freedom and courage to define how they see themselves, and that appeared ridiculous to Muggles. Sun Ra appeared ridiculous to Muggles. Frank Zappa appeared ridiculous to Muggles. Colonel Bruce appeared ridiculous to Muggles. How many people do not know Harry Potter? Okay, so I'm good. See, that's great. You got that coming. Right? I'm not afraid to look ridiculous to Muggles. And when I see people that look ridiculous to Muggles, I go, I probably should talk to that guy unless he's really crazy. <laughs> So we got to approach with caution. <laughs> but that's the person that I'm going to be more interested in because I know that they didn't let the status quo define them. You know, that's how me and Tara Lee became friends. I was like, you're Luna Lovegood, aren't you? She was like, <laughs> like she did. Just, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and so, and, and if when you take these walls away, you don't know what you're going to find. When you strip all your clothes off, you don't know what you're going to see. You may look in the mirror and see an alien, and you'll be like scared of that. I encourage you to go up and hug that alien that you see that is yourself. Give it a big hug and a kiss and thank it. And play with it. Go, let's play. You know? And you may find yourself looking ridiculous to Muggles, too, and not caring. Luna Lovegood didn't give a damn, did she? She could see stuff other people couldn't see. She could see the Thestrals. And then after someone died in Harry's life, he could see him. And he goes, why can't I see him and nobody else? She goes, because sometimes somebody, only people that suffered a death can see them. This is again back to death being the greatest gift. I'm telling you, it runs through everything. It's a great...
cut, it cuts, it's a knife that cuts through all BS, all gaslighting, all brainwashing, all hypnotism, all fear, all this that just cuts through it. And then you're like, oh, how did, see, we got to do these exercises. Go watch the movie about J.K. Rowling. She was on Brit Britain's version of welfare. I think living in her car, had a crap husband that left her, and now she's a single mom, just quit one job after another, just miserable. She was not living how she was supposed to live. She had this beautiful gift, and she didn't have the courage to break these walls, and then her mom was dying, and her mom said, I ain't that children. Now she's a billionaire, but she took all the people from her school, the Weasleys, and all those people, every friggin' one of those people in Harry Potter is from her life. And she was on welfare. Because of that death, she was like, I'm going to go for it. Multi-billionaire. Right? I'm taking copy to get her wand soon. Yeah. <laughs> Can I tell us a story on that? Yeah. Please. So, back in September, or wait, was it, it was this September, when did, we did the thing in the cave. Yes, uh, the cavern. Where I met Johnny. Where he almost got to play with Melvin Seals, but Melvin got sick that Sick. Night. Okay. So, I was going down there in Nashville again, hanging out, doing coffee, doing skateboarding. And I was with Phil. He's back there with the handicap. Documentarian. And we were coming to play this gig with you in a cave. Yeah. I was like, this is crazy. We're doing a cave gig. And we get there about a week early to just hang out with some homies, hang out with Heather, see, uh, see some friends, show the documentary to some things, some people who didn't care. <laughs> <laughs> they don't get me we got. <laughs> and anyway, we're doing these things called the left turn. You guys have done them. They're the hardest turns you can do on the road. <laughs> <Am I right? laughs> and there happens to be a construction zone. Like we're going this way, gonna turn this way, left. And there's this whole construction zone here, coned off and stuff like that. And Phil's driving, I'm in the passenger seat, and we turn left, and a car comes zooming through the construction zone and mm -hmm. T-bones us and hits my side, and we flip over. And flip over and land on top of another car, upside down, me and Phil. And this is right before this gig. And it was one of the craziest moments of my life because we didn't lose a split second. It's one of those things where time slows down and, you know, there's no blackout. There's a, a extreme acute awareness of what's going on around you. And I look over at Phil and I'm like, yeah, you good? He's like, yeah, you good? Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we go, what about we're upside down, I guess we just wait. Can't open the door. <laughs> and now there's like these bags full of air around me. I can cramp in my style. <laughs> and the radio is not even working at this yeah. point. No. So there's no tunes. <laughs> and then some. <laughs> Yeah, he didn't even offer me that, Phil. <laughs> Selfish. Acting like, <laughs> like we just could have died. And anyway, somehow we get flipped back over. We didn't do it because we're just in seatbelts like. <laughs> <laughs> I was probably playing Game Boy. Hanging out, dude. <laughs> yeah, Pokemon, the early one. And then, uh, and then, yeah, we just get flipped back over like magic, or somebody pushed us, we don't know. And, and they were like, yeah, okay, cool. And then I go to get out and my door's messed up because apparently someone hit it. And so I unlock it and it still won't open. 
And so we just have to get out of his door. And we literally just walk out of the car and just go set in the grass. I do a couple deep breaths to rebalance my heart that was pumping because he didn't offer me a piece of gum. <laughs> and then, like, I'm just sitting there like, this is crazy. But I'm just like so aware, there's no bruises, there's no cuts, there's no scrapes on either of us at all. And turns out we're just a block away from our old house. We just push the car up there, and then we go to our other buddy's house and just uh, start hanging out because it was right after Americana Fest. And so we're just chilling there, and we're, we just have this moment to where, like, we write movies too, and we're like, you know, if if, if you think real life makes sense. You're on your own, bud. <laughs> <laughs> and it was just this moment where I almost died. And then I came to play with you. And the, mon and the Monday after that, a person did the same thing and died. Mm -hmm. And it's mm -hmm. those moments where I'm just like, anybody who tells me what to do or how to live my life, sorry, you're not winning because I almost died, and that death cut through to where every step I take has deep intention. And when you use that in your playing and in life, I think that's when you start to feel into it. And that's what, that's what it is to me. You know, death cut through so hard that it's like, I need to tune up my life. I'm not saying that out of tune guitar sounds great, but, or sounds terrible. That's not up to me. You know? But so that true, changed man. my life that day. I almost died again. And that changed my life. <laughs> and then I got to play a cave with this guy, and then I met this guy, and then. And that night I dressed up in a Randy Savage costume. Yeah, he did. Macho Man. I came out as Macho Man. That's right, and also the same night as 10. George Porter, bass player for the Meters. You know, if you have a top three biggest bass heroes, he's in there. I don't know which number he is. He came to see us that night, and I was like, oh, were you, were you here on a gig? He's, no, we drove here just to see you. I was like, where, from Nashville? He goes, no, from, from uh, New Orleans. I was like, how long was that drive? He was like, it was 10 hours. I was like, you and your girlfriend drove 10 hours just to come to the caverns and see us play? Like, I'm sure we're coming to New Orleans at some point. <laughs> you know? I was just so humbled, you know? And I got the pictures of me sitting there in my Macho Man costume talking to George. <laughs> He almost died, you know, his car flipped upside down, landed on top of another car, and they still don't have a scratch on him. Like, this is how this stuff works. All right, anyway, I, I know you saw God, I only have 15 minutes to do it, but we were, we're gonna do some exercises here. Is Nikki here? Is, well, no, I got Johnny. I want you, is Pete Lemon here? Pete, come up real quick. Uh, oh, maybe it's Jaden, or is Jaden? Come on, I'm gonna put you to work. I'm working, that's part of getting put over is <laughs> you get bored. <laughs> so I heard the, uh, first of all, just a quick second while everybody's coming up. From yesterday's thing, yesterday's talk about the spirit of play, the stakes being higher, using space, silence, how does that work for you guys? Do you feel like that, that helped you yesterday in your jams? Just by show of hands. To, okay, good. I, I felt like I was hearing it coming across as I walked around. But I just want to check and make sure. Um, it, uh, 
the funk and the bluegrass as an actual like serious concentration are more recent. We've been doing some more funk stuff because with Medeski here, we like did, did this some James Brown and stuff like that. And um, but last night I was hearing a lot of funk. And so I want to drill down on it a little bit. I just want to give you a little exercise that you could do. It's something that I did with Tedeschi Trucks Band. And what he's doing is taking whatever you're playing and editing it. Just keep taking something out of it. Keep minusing something from it until you get to a phrase that's only two beats. So, um, and, and I want to do this as a rhythmic exercise. This is not really harmonic, although we're, uh, we can pick a key if we want to. Um, and so I had this bass line. And so I kept minusing stuff from it until I got to do. And I was like, that's all this really needs. You know, people like, I've always known as the guy that overplays. So, and I feel like if it's in the groove, then I'm not overplaying. And if it interrupts the groove or the flow of the solos, then I am. But just as an experiment, I was like, just try less is more. And so I kept taking something away from it. And that's a two bar thing. One, two, do, do, do. and I started realizing a lot of funk is these things that are call and response, and then it's like African drums where there's a two beat phrase here, there's a two beat phrase that answers it, there's one that's like the upbeats around it, you keep adding these little phrases until you get this thing that's like, you know, we call it cogging, <laughs> cogs. You know, when you see sprockets and they always meet up, right? Um, so I want to do this as an experiment and I want to have, and then I want to have you guys do it. So we're going to start with the drum. We can't go behind, go in front. So just, uh, just four and a four.
I like that. <laughs> I was like, yeah. Funk. Kofi Burbridge. Funk. 101. You hear how hard that grooves? I started with just one, two, three, four. We weren't in any key. I wasn't doing any phrase that was longer than two beats. We put, we layered it, put it together. That's Africa right there. That's how that shit works. Okay, we just, where beats are melodies. And we layer these phrases as they layer together and make a melody. And it starts cogging like, and it propels itself. And they will go all night, and then into the next day, and the next night, and the next day, and the next night. You see Carnival and these things, and Mardi Gras, and they go, they just keep going. They have bluegrass stuff like that in High Lonesome. And you should watch that documentary about Bill Monroe, and they would have these things in the field. It would go for days, it just keeps going. Because that trance, you get in there, you see third day back, third one. <laughs> I'm old now, he can just go for days, literally for days, you know. So I want to come up, I want you guys to come up and do that. You stay, you stay, the rest of us are going to go. I want someone else on keys, on drums, and, uh, well, yeah, we'll, you go and we'll have someone else come up. And I want to do the same thing, I want to start, I want to help you see how simple it is to build, not saying it's easy, but how simple it is, because it has to be in the groove, it has to swing. But you only need two beats to do it, and the shorter phrase, the better. And one thing where this is really gonna happen when I see these fun jams, and there's two or three guitar players playing at once, everybody's going, like, strumming. It's like, make three parts. Yeah, no, no, yeah.